let me uh, let me share a couple of scriptures from uh, Isaiah 61. We were almost finished with that anyway, but I just want to share scripture uh, 10, 11 with you tonight, and uh, because it talks about a covenant. Now. Y'all, y'all know what a covenant is. Everybody in here know what a covenant is. Basically a promise that can never be broken, supposed to never be broken. And uh, so if you know what a covenant is, God made a covenant with Abraham that he would be his God and Abraham would be uh, his child and all the seed of Abraham and that, that God would bless the seed of Abraham and the seed of Isaac. And that he made a covenant right then and there with Israel, basically the future of Israel. And his covenant was that he would be their God and he'd always be with them. He'd never leave them or forsake them. And if folks, I'm just telling you this is important because out of all the world today, what's going on with Israel, <clears throat> when all the nations forsake Israel and not get involved and let Israel appear to let Israel be destroyed, God won't. And if you, there's, there's one that you want on your side when you're in battles, and that is God. And he's the only one that you need. I don't know how this will work out. I don't know if what we're seeing is the beginning of the last 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 day and that trump of sound. It could be. So I'm just telling you that uh, the Lord will stand with Israel. He will will not forsake them. And so I love this covenant he makes. Uh, And he brings salvation and righteousness. This is what he does, and this is what Isaiah is speaking upon uh, Israel. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Is your soul joyful in your God? I mean, he's our God too. And, you know, you have your good days and bad days, and I'm just going to tell you. Sometimes you have, when you have bad days or you hear bad news or you're overwhelmed with everything, you need to know that your soul, you need to know that God is there. Amen. Never leaves me nor forsakes me. He gave me the same promise, same covenant. The Bible teaches that. The Word of God teaches that. To the man that would take him as Lord and Savior, he says, I'll graft you into this vine. You'll be birthed into this family. You'll be forever mine. You're my adopted child. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he's always there with us. When everyone else seems like they're gone, God is there. Always. So he's covered me. It goes on and says, He's covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks herself with ornaments. And of course, we know that the bridegroom is the church. We know that one day he's going to come back. And he's going to take his bride to to heaven. We're going to have a marriage supper to the Lamb. It's going to be really good. And uh, and the bride adorns herself with jewels. And you know what? If you're if you're if you're loving, if you're if you're in fellowship with the Almighty God and Jesus Christ is our Savior and our our husband, so to speak, from the church's standpoint, then what? type of adorning should you do? Pleasing God, walking with Him, seeking Him, doing righteousness, living a holy life. These are things you, you're to do so when He comes for you that you will, you will be, I'd say, beautiful or in the graces of God. And as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so shall the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. I don't know, 
You know, I can only tell you that there's been times in history when you can read history and realize that nations have come to know God and, and they have sort of been spring forth a little bit, but we've got to be talking about the end where all nations will come to know God, many people, many tribes, many nations. And when they do, they'll spring forth. You know, uh, I went down to uh, the land the other day because I heard there was the rain coming. This was a couple weeks ago. There was the rain coming. And so I went down there and got out the tractor and the plow and, and dished up this, the soil. Broke it up to where it'd be, you know, fertile, as they call it, or loose. Sowed the seed on it and then covered the seed. That's all great. But if no rain, that seed won't grow. So the rains came. And I went back out there the other day, and guess what? There's all these shoots popping up. And so what you, yeah, I, I got a green thumb after all. Even though I do it, even though I do it from a, a tractor, and I just throw stuff out there, and I go, God, you're going to have to make it grow, because I certainly can't. However, it popped up. And you know, um, when you stop and think about that for a minute, your life, your life, God took your life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You needed to die spiritually to that. And that's exactly what a seed does. It kind of, when it germinates, it, it's a process it goes through, past of spring forth. And so what happens in your life when God took a hold of it, he you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You gave that all to him. That's all washed away. And then he began to rain on your life like you had never seen before. And you start, and, and something beautiful springs up. What is it? It's a changed life. That's what it is. And I'm going to tell you, God loves it. God loves it when a man changed. And... Um, and he'll continue to do that. So I just wanted to tell you that this covenant that God has made with Israel, he made it with us as well. And God will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you believe that tonight? That's what the scriptures say. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He is always with you. You need to remember that. Because I have to remind myself sometimes when the world starts pushing against you or something ain't going my way, oh, pitiful me, right? That's usually what happens. You get to think about all the problems, all the troubles. And then all you got to do is for a moment sit down and think, God is with me. God knew all of this way before I knew it. Now, what's his plan? Maybe something needs to die so it can spring forth. Maybe something needs to be Put in the ground. The seeds need to be sown. What does God need me to do? And I'll tell you what, God leads you out every time. And he, he does that. So we get over into Isaiah chapter 62. <clears throat> Israel, if you got, or you got a study Bible, Jerusalem is loved and protected. Do you know that? Well, it's, it is. When you hear the Zion mentioned, Zion is a direct translation to meaning Jerusalem or even in whole Israel. So this is what it says. For Zion's sake, I will not hold, back, hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory. They shall be called, they sh you shall be called by a new name. God has a, God has a way of changing your name. 
<laughs> I mean, he's good at that. He's changed old Saul to Paul, right? Used to be Saul, now he's Paul. I mean, God has a, and then he's going to change your name into a new name in heaven. Remember? We talked about that in the churches. Your name's going to be written on the column in the, in the, in the, in the, in the New Jerusalem. And so your name's written there. Who knows what it's going to be? It's just like I said, I hope I can pronounce it now. And then he said, I'll give you, I shall call you a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. He'll give you that name. It comes from him, no one else. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Now look at that. I like that last part of your God. He's my God. If he's your God tonight, I hope he's your God. So he, he's our God, but he's, I love it when God talks about over in Revelation where I'll wipe away all their tears. I will be their God and they will be my people. I love that when it says that because I'm in the household of God at that moment. Um, you know, we sing a song, talks about the royal diadem. It's a crown. It's a headband what it is. It's a symbol of sovereignty. That's what it is. And so here's Zion that he talks about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, folks, is, his, is God's city. It is God's city. Matter of fact, you read all the way to the end of Revelation, you'll find out he's bringing down a new Jerusalem. What says that? Right down to where? Yeah. After God has done all that he's doing, this is, we're talking at the very end of the end of the story as we know it on earth, the beginning of eternity with God. But, yeah, the ultimate, yeah. And so he brings it down and we'll, we'll all reside in the New Jerusalem. We'll all live in Zion. Now, and we'll all live in peace. It, this woman said today, I was listening to one of the uh, interviews of the woman in Gaza. A woman that had a business in Gaza. She had a bakery. And of course Israel, you know, they shot their missiles over in Gaza where they thought the Hamas was their headquarters and all their little holdout areas and they were bombing those areas, which they should. I, I'm, I mean, you know, you got you to gotta do that. You got to get rid of what's evil. But they were doing that. Well, in the, in the collateral damage of it, her store was hit, and, and her neighborhood um, was kind of pretty much bombarded pretty good. And she said, this is her comment, she said, it will take five years to rebuild if we don't have three more wars before the five years is up. That's, she's already thinking that way. She's never, what she's saying to you, is that in her lifetime in Gaza, now this is where this can play against Israel a little bit, she's saying that she's never had peace. She's never experienced peace, peace in her lifetime. And she's trying to, she's just trying to live. That's the idea she's giving you. She's just trying to live, not hurt nobody, sell a few bakery and make a living. And, but they're not going to let it happen because there's going to be war constantly. Can you imagine a earth? Can you imagine a planet with no war? Okay? That's supposed to be in a thousand year reign. There's no war? Can you imagine? We live in a we live in a a fallen, broken world and all of us in here because of sin it all started because of sin and it weaved its way and the first war that took place was between two brothers well Cain's one initiated and life was taken first life that was taken and since then there's been countless numbers of lives taken all because of someone hating someone someone not liking someone so let's just 
do away with them. Now, I'm going to tell you there's going to be peace coming. Um, righteousness, however, I do believe that righteousness is in the believer today. And it should be in the church today. And Gentiles and Jews and I'll just say all kinds of people, all, to, all nations, all people ought to be able to look at the church today, the real church, and see people that have a genuine relationship with Christ living a righteous, holy life. That's what they should see. That will change people. But if they look at the church and they don't see that, they see a church that's divided, a church that's acting like the world, a church that's very divisive and, and warring among each other, that won't change them. They're used to that out there. So I'm telling you, um, you are, you know, okay, you get up in the morning. Remember I told you about that prayer Sunday morning? God, I, so far I haven't done anything wrong. But I'm about to get up. Y'all remember that prayer? Okay. So you got to remember that. I'm about to get up. And you look in the mirror. And you go. I'll take a page out of Pastor Deal's comment while I go. You look in the mirror and you go, ooh, the vapor is vanishing. <laughs> right? The next thought that comes to your mind is how long? How long? If it's, it's the vapor's vanished mostly, three quarters of its way, and, and as my brother tells me, we're in the two minute warning in life, <laughs> it doesn't take long for the rest of that life to be over. That's, what they're, that's the point. Now the point is, I can do all this kind of stuff. I can go out there. I can build all these buildings. I can do all this kind of stuff. I can, I can, I don't know, create things that will help people. But if I don't live for Christ and people can't see a changed life in me, hopefully I give them something and my life reflects something to them that will change your life. And that is Christ. It, it, it doesn't hold no way. Look, if I'm on the side of the street and I got a flat tire and I'm sitting there cussing that flat tire. <laughs> I, I fuck, <laughs> wait a minute. Y'all trying to look at me like, well, Christians ain't supposed to do that. Yeah, we ain't supposed to do that. You're exactly right. But it happens. I've seen Christians say things and do things that they shouldn't be doing, right? And here comes, here comes old, you know, good old Joe that don't go to church and don't serve the Lord and don't even know the Lord. But he knows you. And he comes by and he sees you over there cussing your flat tire. My mother... Bless her heart. Every time I would use a hot shot on a cow or a whip to make it do what I wanted to do, she would say to me, you call yourself a Christian. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is herd some cattle in a crowd. And you call yourself a Christian. You're inflicting pain. She loved cows. She loved cows. <laughs> she did. She loved cows so much. I told somebody the other day, I couldn't believe it. We had a sick calf once. I never underestimate her. She would just do whatever she wanted to do. It was a total surprise sometimes when you come home. But I went off to, I think I was in my last year of high school, and I went to school, and I come back in. I opened the front. It was cold, rainy. Opened the door, and there laid a calf <laughs> in the middle of the living room floor on a big blanket. Now, a quilt that she had quilted. I mean, we had quilts on our bed, but, you know, calf getting pretty good quilt. And she, he's laying there, and I, I'm going, what are you doing? Well, sick. 
and she, she just loves cow so much that she would nurse it. But I said, what about if it does, you know, what it's not supposed to do in the house? You're trusting it won't do that, and it's the cow that's going to do that. But anyway, so she would see that kind of as you. She seen my attitude as not being Christian. I guess that's the best way I can say it. And there's people that look at you and in some of the oddest ways they look at you and, and they'll derive from their odd ways of looking at you whether or not you really love the Lord or not. Are you really serving Him or not? If you've really been changed or not. I know it's odd, but folks, uh, I guess where I'm going with that is God's people. God's people ought to be at peace. They ought to be righteous. They ought to be helpful. God's people ought to be the very first ones that take their shirt off their back for somebody. God's people ought to be in nature, pleasant, to be around, not a jerk. Yes. I know. As much as possible. So, <clears throat> you, um, you guys like to eat. I know it, I've seen it. <laughs> and you heard the old phrase, the proof's in the pudding? Y'all ever heard that? Well, today I stopped by to get me some pudding because it was technically some of the best chocolate pudding in town. And I was over in the area, and it was lunchtime, and I'd done it eating. I said, well, I'll just stop in here and get the chocolate pudding. And took a bite of it. It did not taste like it used to taste. Oh. Somebody changed something. Somebody changed something in the recipe. And it's not no good no more. And I'll tell you what, sometimes when I look at that and I think, the, is there consistency right. in my life, in my Christian life? Yeah. Because sometimes, folks, people are going to taste the life oh, yeah. in, in so many ways, and it ought to be the same. Don't change the recipe. Don't change the recipe. That's my point, yeah. Don't change the recipe. <laughs> let God work in you the work that he's began and let him complete it. And don't ch stop it and say, oh, Lord, I don't want that. I don't want to change like that. I don't want to transform. I don't want to add that ingredient to my life. I want it this way. When you do that, you mess, with, you mess it all up. So the Lord loves Zion. As a bridegroom, he loves the loves bride as, as he loves the bride. And I want to read you this next set of scriptures. We'll stop here in 9 and 4 and 5. You shall no longer be termed forsaken. You're not. Nor shall your land be termed desolate. But you shall be called, and this is not Hezbollah, it's Hezbollah. I can't pronounce it right. And your land Beulah. What those two names mean is the first one means my delight is in her. And the second one means bride or married. So this is what God says. He's going to be married to you. That's what he's saying. And he delights himself in you. What, what do we say? We quote, God inhabits the praise of his people. You don't inhabit something if you don't like it, do you? So God likes it when you praise him. And he inhabits the praise of his people. He likes it when you serve him. And he inhabits 
your life. I mean, it's just, it's just there. It's, you're a delight to him when you're serving him. But what about when you're not? <laughs> oh, me. You're not much of a delight. You know, God has to get out that spiritual belt and work you over. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as your young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. So what's this marriage supper to lamb going to look like? When we all get to heaven and, 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 and we're before God, the church is, the bride of Christ, and we're in that, and, and, and folks, I got to tell you, best I can understand, and, and what I feel like the Lord has shown me, there's all hell on earth taking place, but in heaven, there's a marriage ceremony taking place. What's it going to look like? Is, is, the, is the groom going to come out there kind of like, oh, gosh, you mean i got to marry this? Put your veil back on. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, <laughs> y'all ever seen that? Y'all ever seen that movie years ago? Probably shouldn't be watching this. I shouldn't even like this. But anyway, this guy in this movie said, his father told him, says, if you don't marry that girl, you're going to lose $44 million, your inheritance. I'm not giving it to you. He says, well, I don't care, Dad. She's just kind of like, she ain't nothing to look at. I don't care. He starts to walk out the door. He stops and turns around. And he says to his father, he says, you know when the sun hits her just right, so he's having second thoughts of the 44 million he's about to lose. But that's not going to happen. When God sees you, it says right here he's going to have a delight. He's going to be joyful. Now, let's go back to all of us guys in here. When you married your wife. Now, come on. You, you were thinking, oh, this is the best day of my life. There you go. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. This is the best day of my life. You know, um, when my son got married, he played that song, that country and western song, This is the Best Day of My Life. And, and a friend of mine was sitting here that, that was there at the wedding, here at the wedding, and he told me, he said, you know, I looked at all the years he grew up. And he said, and I was over there just crying. And I'm a grown man. I'm over there crying because I'm just seeing what, you know, this could be the best day of my life. Folks, our best day is coming. Our best life is coming. It's in heaven with God. And when we experience that marriage supper of the Lamb, I'm going to tell you what. He is going to be delighted. There's going to be nothing but joy. And joy's unspeakable. You won't be able to. How much joy can you handle? Bring it on, God. You know, all the joy is going to flood your heart. And me just getting there. <laughs> somebody, somebody, I had a Christian friend the other day. Um, we were talking about heaven. And that's what his comment was. He said, well, I just got to get there. I said, well, you're going to get there. Don't you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He said, yeah, but if he knows all the things I've done, he ain't going to let me in. I said, but if you know him as your Lord and Savior, have you given your life to him? Have you surrendered to him? Have you allowed him to change you? Have you allowed him to work in your life? Do you do, you do that? I mean, or do you just take him as an insurance policy? Now, come on. And so he said, yeah, I know, Robert. He said, but I got to just get there. I used to have a man that would come in my office all the time, and he w was scared that when he committed a sin, that, uh-oh, that just knocked him out of heaven. Forsaken. That's what it was. Well, that's what it would be. And he, he was worried about that. And I said, 
Well, is God your God, and he is, then get on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. And what will he do? And I was reading him the verses what do, in 1 John. What does God do when a man calls out to him and asks for forgiveness? Is he just going to turn his back on him? No. He's going to give him forgiveness. And I said, get up and try not to do it again. Okay, so I'm going to end this this way. I'm going to use this on you that I used on somebody today we were teaching. We were talking about uh, uh, discipline in Christ and marriage counseling and all this other stuff. You remember the woman that was caught in adultery? You remember they brought uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, trying to catch, catch Jesus in kind of a pickle here? And so they brought her to him and says, she is caught in adultery, red-handed, basically. She's really caught. And Moses' law says, stone her. Remember that? What's Jesus doing the whole time? Read the text. He's, not li- he's appearing not even to hear them, but he's writing in the sand. Probably the Pharisee over to the left saying, Moses' law says stone her. He's probably writing in the sand, steal, cheat, lie, of what those guys had done. Because that's a sin, adultery was. And then he says, what did Jesus say? He that's without sin, he cast the first stone. Was there any stone thrown that day? No. No. That tells you humanity. And then the woman gets up, or Jesus says, she gets up and, the woman, and he says to her, where's your accusers? And she said, they're all gone. He says, neither do I condemn thee either. He said, go, and what did he say to her? Sin no, Sin no more. Oh, I, told, I said, that's the, if, if he'd have left off that last part, if he just said go, you know, but he's trying, to, he's trying to tell her, look, I forgive you that. I'm not condemning you. Go and live differently. Don't be back and caught in this situation again. And so that's what we were talking about. And I tell you, sometimes us Christians, we, we do the same old thing expecting a different result. And it's not that. It's not going to happen. So anyway... For us to experience this, for us to have this, is all because of what God said. You've done nothing. What have you brought to the table? I'll tell you what you brought to the table. (laughs) Bible calls it what? Filthy rags. That's all you brought to the table. And then God loved you and saved you. Now, what have you brought to the table yet? When he takes and saves you and he starts transforming you, it's him that does that. The only thing you can say, the only thing you can say with a little bit of a pinch of I did that, is to say, God, I submit to you. Have your will and your way in my life. That's all you can do. And God will take you and make you into him extraordinary person. You know, you're not ordinary anymore. Do you know that? You're not ordinary no more. You've been changed. You're extraordinary in Christ Jesus. So, go live it. Tell everybody you can about it. And we're going to see where Isaiah was prophesying to Israel what's coming, the joys of that's coming. And I'll tell you what, Jesus is coming. And when Jesus arrives, Israel peace. Now we know as we study on, we know at the second coming, when Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, all the world, all those that, that 
that rejected him, all, the, all those people going more, and they're going to realize this is God. This is the Son of God. So uh, let him have his will and his way in your life tonight. Father, I thank you for this day, and thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house tonight. Lord, I, I truly want to live for you. Lord, and I know these hearts in here as well. Lord, they want to live for you. Father, I know that we're a mess sometimes. I know that we can get ourselves in trouble. Lord, we can do things that are not pleasing in your sight. And so, Lord, I ask your forgiveness. I ask your forgiveness, Lord, when I get my eyes off of the main thing. And the main thing, Lord, or the main cause or the main way is keeping my eyes fixed on you. And sometimes, Lord, we get them off onto this world. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, that we put our eyes and our entire life focused back on you. Because you begin a good work in us and you're faithful to complete it. And so, Lord, I only ask, Lord, that I be submissive and surrender my will, Lord, to you tonight. Lord, have your way in my life tonight. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do and what we're going to see in the future, Lord. We already know the plan. We already know what's going to take place, Lord. And just help us to be ready for the day that trumpet sounds. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.